So thank you very much, Theo, for the introduction. Um, my interest in diversity stems back for quite a while. Theo mentioned that my background is in engineering, and you might be wondering how an engineer became a social scientist. Well, in part, it was this. So I studied civil and architectural engineering, and I worked <laughs> for about five years in the construction industry. I know, right? It's sort of like bad high school shots, right? <laughs> so, bad first job shots. Um, and that is me. So you can imagine that being an engineer and being a, a female in the construction setting would put me in the minority. Being a female of color would put me at distinctly more in the minority, and you would be right, right? So this is actually in Chicago on the job site of what was then the new Chicago Board of Trade. And I found that in that space, I was really curious about being different, like feeling like I was different in these different ways and how that impacted how I interacted with my colleagues. Well, the short version is that turned into an interest in social science and studying these issues of diversity in teams. And so hopefully today we'll gain some insights into what do I mean by that and how can that impact you and your role in, as an advancement for the University of Illinois. So when I think about diversity and that context, I really like to think about this quote, right? And this idea of the diversity and the value that diversity brings. So it's hardly possible to overrate the value of placing human beings in contact with persons dissimilar to themselves and with modes of thought and action unlike those with which they are familiar. Such communication has always been and is peculiarly in the present age one of the primary sources of progress. So I love this quote because it's, you know, it's talking about, okay, what is this inherent value that we see when we talk about diversity? And really in this peculiarly present age where we have individuals who are interacting with each other in great extent, more than many, many may say at any other point in history, right? Where we have technology and transportation and the ability to connect and be engaged with others who are different from ourselves. But one of the things that I love about this quote is that it's actually from a philosopher from 1848, right? So there was a peculiar present age then, and we are still in this present age where we see, you know, that there's some value to these differences. What do I mean by diversity? So for me and for my work, and I'll be talking about it in more detail in a little while, any salient difference between members of a group. So of course, when we think about diversity, we're in the United States, we, you know, many of us are coming from this context, we think reasonably about things like gender, age, religious differences, disability, et cetera. But there can be many other differences that are salient to people in a context that signal diversity, right? Something that maybe an outsider wouldn't even recognize as distinguishing individuals from a group, right? Which department you belong to, what major you had in college, what level you are in the organization, all of those things represent diversity. So before we get into, you know, how do we unleash this value of diversity and, and how inclusion really pushes this further, I'd like for us to engage in a small exercise to help us just think about recognizing what the differences are and similarities are between us. So I see some very full tables and I see some less full tables. We are gonna engage in an exercise, or I say you are, um, that I called the flower exercise. I actually didn't name it. I mean, if you've done this before, awesome. Uh, you should bring all your you know, knowledge and information from that to bear in this context. So I'm going to ask you all to break into smaller groups. So actually, we'll take a moment and pause and let us do that. I would like for all the tables to be filled, and by that I mean to have at least five people at each table. So if you're currently at a table with eight, nine, they're like, yes, all the fives are like, we're not moving, sitting right here. Look at this beautiful table right here. I have a lovely table up at the front. <laughs> Thank you, Theo. I know. She... <laughs> no, oh wait, I'm, I'm sorry, wait, wait. Let, 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 me, let me restate this. I see, I see, here we go, here we go. Apologies, apologies to those of you at large tables. I know. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, excuse me, hello, hello. <laughs> let me restate, Theo's like, yeah, that didn't go well, right? 
Okay, so five to six people. No more than six people. No fewer than five people. Aha! We need some people. So if you're at a very large table, I invite some of you to, to move to another table. Thank you. Exactly. That's right. And I love you guys. I invite half of this table to come right here. You gotta move. You gotta move. All right. <laughs> All right, are we good? Are we good? Are we good? Excellent. All right. All right, are we good? Yes. All right, bring it on. Okay. Whew. <laughs> I really, we <laughs> do we need a hand? <laughs> Feels like we need a hand, like getting to tables. Yes, all right. All right. Now that you are at your tables, let's talk about what you're going to do. So you may notice in the center of your table some paper, some crayons, and a couple of markers. So not only do I get some of you at least up and moving around, you can't hear me. Is that because of those people? I know it's too noisy in here. May I have everyone's attention, please? May I have everyone's attention, please? Are you doing that? Doing that? That like clap once if you can hear me. Clap twice if you can hear me. Okay. Thank you. I love it. What a boisterous crowd. All right. Well, we love this energy. We don't want to spend all of our time creating groups, right? We want to actually do stuff. So <laughs> let's do some stuff. So you're going to break, you're breaking in, broken into groups. In the middle of the table, there's some eight and a half by 11 blank paper, some crayons, some markers. You are going to draw a flower together. This is amazing, right? We're going to work on drawing a flower together. And what does this flower represent? So one of those sheets of paper should represent the center of the flower. The center of the flower, you will create, draw, right? A flower center, and then you will write in the center things that you have in common, things that make you similar to each other in the group. Then each of the other sheets of paper is going to represent a petal. You can draw your petal, you can be creative, and each petal represents things that make you unique from everyone else at the table. So. We will, once again, hear the conversation level rise because we're going to have to talk to each other about things that make us similar to each other and different from each other. Okay. Well, hold on. Hold. Bear with me. Just stick. Hold tight. Hold tight. For about 30 more seconds. Okay. So, you will draw this. It'll be a little bit more challenging to hold up, but we'll do our best. And then a few, maybe a couple of tables I'll ask to present their flowers. Now, when we think about the center, you know, let's not go for the completely low-hanging fruit like humans, we're all humans. <laughs> Although if you have any questions about that, you can see Theo later if you're wondering about anyone at your table, okay? So don't go for the complete low-hanging fruit, but you know, just brainstorm and talk amongst yourselves. And you know, everybody pull out their petals so you can start thinking about and working on your differences on the petals, similarity in the circle. Questions? All right, awesome. So, oh yeah, question? No, we're good. All right. About 10 minutes. For the individual petals, is it your individual specific difference to, or collectively our differences on Your individual difference.
All right, so it looks like I've walked around the room and I think every table has at least one unique thing that you know, each person has found about themselves. So let's talk about it a little bit. First of all, there, is there a brave table that would be willing to share their flower with us and either the whole table or some representative introduce, introduce us to their table? Well, so I was like, like in this crowd, I cannot imagine that that's not true, right? All right. Okay. Hi. Um, we. This is our STEM. We're all um, all work at the U of I. I know. Aha. Right. Caucasian. We're all over 21, but under 70. We all can drive. We. We did. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Wowzers, all righty, um, We all commute into our jobs. We're all born in the USA. We've traveled internationally. Um, we all have had outside employment from the U of I. We have all been to Allerton. We are all right-handed. We all have siblings. We've all either had a broken bone or an operation. We all have bachelor's degrees. We've all been in car accidents and obviously have survived to talk about it. And we all have traveled by train. Awesome. And your uniqueness? Oh, our uniqueness. Okay, so I'll pass it So mine, I thought I, I was one and done. I was just happy. I was a pork queen. Um, the, what's that? What? Yes, I have to explain that to a few people around my table. So, you know, if you were in the College of Aces, you would know there's been dairy queens, there's beef queens. We've got all sorts of queens. Um, I went to Iowa State, so I was different at the table, and I've been to Japan. I'll just name a few. Uh, I was, I've been to the U of I the, least, the I guess, least amount long length of time, less than three months. Um, I traveled to China. Uh, I've got a black belt, and I've shaken hands with two current living U.S. presidents. Hi. So I was bit by a dog on my face when I was five. <laughs> I have, <laughs> it was ser bad, 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 bad stuff. I still have a dog, don't worry, I love them. Um, I lived in Germany. I have hiked the PCT. Um, I have I shook Joe Biden's hand, and I have four siblings. <laughs> I've been at the U of I for 34 years. I worked at Walt Disney World in college, and I got Daniel Radcliffe's autograph in New York City. <laughs> mm. uh, I play the spoons. And I worked for a family that owned funeral homes. <laughs> I uh, drove a Zamboni and I lived in Italy. Awesome. All right. All right. Let us give a round of applause to that table, the daring table in the back. So I'm sure a number of those things sounded familiar to many of you. Do we have one other table that maybe had some, something that was a little bit different in terms of the differences or similarities that would like to share their tables outcome? <laughs> oh, Dale, did you want to share? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, look, I love it. How do we flip that script? <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, what hasn't been covered? Oh, we've all been to a county fair. We're all over five feet tall. We all like the beach. We all love to read. We've all played instruments in our former lives. We all like to eat soup. Each one of us has lived in another state besides Illinois. And we all grew up in hometowns of less than 100,000 people. Just Can you even share Police. <laughs> okay, so you can't see my paper, but I, I drew the sign of a Gemini and put times two because I have a twin sister and I also have twin daughters. Also, I have four children, so pray for me. Um, I'm also the only person at the table to fracture their lateral tibial plateau. 
in a highly contested game of dodgeball. Uh, and I uh, majored in biology in college, and I went to Mizzou. Uh. <laughs> so I lived in Washington. I have children out of college. Uh, I'm divorced. I worked at a hospital. I have all sons, and my degrees were in music and business. I was the only communication major at this table, the only former SIU Edwardsville employee, and I have the longest commute. I have a cat. <laughs> uh, I know, right? His name is Nacho. Uh, I went to SIUC, and my major was history. I've lived abroad. I'm the only one at the table who lives in Urbana. Um, I worked for a political campaign, and I have more than one dog. I lived in South Dakota. I live in St. Joe. I was a psychology major, and I'm the only one with a boy and a girl. Awesome. Thank you. A round of applause for everyone in the room. Okay, so raise your hand if through this exercise you learned something new about somebody that was sitting at your table. Okay, now keep your hand up if you think that that's something new that you learned might help further your advancement goals. Or you just keep your hand, all hands went down. So raise your hand if you think that it might. Okay. So we only had, right? So there's at least, I would say about half of the people in the room in 10 minutes, right? 12 minutes, just learn something new about people with whom they work and who I would argue it's useful to collaborate with to help further the goals of this group and the institution, right? New knowledge that might help you connect to individuals with whom you are trying to build relationships in different ways. So to me, that's part of the power of diversity, but the issue is that it doesn't work if we don't actually understand where our similarities and differences lie, right? If we don't know enough about who we're working with, to see below the surface, in many instances, to other interactions, experiences, um, you know, background information that we have that might be useful for us to leverage as an organization or as a group. So I'm gonna turn the next session, that's part of the session, to some of my work and some done by others that helps us unpack a little bit more what is this underlying value that diversity and more so inclusion bring to the table. So, diversity makes us rich, great slide, right? So I am in the College of Business, the Geese College of Business, and uh, there's work that's been done in the context of thinking about organizations and markets that has shown some differences. So, in 2009, an ASA publication showed that companies reporting the highest levels of racial diversity brought in nearly 15 times more sales revenue on average than those with the lowest levels of racial diversity. 2014 study, the CAC 40, so that's in France sort of like their big indice and you know, the top 40 companies in their large index. Companies with a higher proportion of women on their boards outperform those with a lower proportion in terms of return on sales. In the 2015 McKinsey study, showing that companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above their respective national industry means. So certainly for individuals who are in the context of business, you know, a question has been, right, this sort of business case for diversity, not a huge fan of that language, but that's out there, right, and there's been some evidence that there is some business case for diversity. So what is this about, right? How does diversity affect performance? So empirical work, like some of the things I've just shown you, shows diversity can and does under the right circumstances, let's make sure we emphasize that, lead to better performance and decision making in groups, especially in contexts where information has to be shared and processed to be successful. But, and the big but is, one of the challenges of looking at it in the, those contexts is that there are so many moving parts that are happening at the same time in those contexts that it's sometimes hard to isolate the effect of this difference, right? Like, what is it about 
you know, there being a larger percentage of racial and ethnic minorities that leads to some better performance outcomes. So for me, that's where the type of work I feel comes in and adds some discussion to this question. So I do a lot of work in using a laboratory experiment paradigm. So some of you, if you were psychology majors, you may remember that from psychology, right? So where we generally use this type of process. One, I have some type of social category diversity. By that, I mean these, you know, any difference that's salient. So it could be race or gender. It could be political affiliation that I make salient to people. It could be which side of campus you live on. And then there's also some information or opinion diversity, right? So some differences in opinion about the task that we have to work on, right? What's the best way for us to do this? What's the best solution? Part of the reason that I care about that is when you think about groups and working together in groups to try to achieve better outcomes, if we all sit at the table and we all have the same opinion, there's not a whole lot of discussion to be had there, right? In fact, I might argue that if the solution is that obvious that everybody in the table agrees that we probably didn't need a group of people to make that decision, right? The types of decisions that we benefit from using groups for are complex decisions where there's not an obvious answer and we really need individuals to bring their perspectives to bear on this issue. So I bring this in, informational or opinion diversity. Then I have individuals, imagine if you're in one of my studies, make a decision about something and then meet with a group, discuss it with a group, and then the group comes to some decision. And oftentimes I am measuring not only your individual, what decision you made, and let me ask you questions afterward about your experience in the group, but also I'll videotape the group and that can let me observe, right? Interactions, who's talking to whom, how much are you speaking? If you said something that nobody else knew or had an opinion different, does somebody repeat that opinion? To really get at the microprocesses of what's happening in these groups. So broadly speaking, I would say across my work and, and that of a number of colleagues of mine, we find this similar pattern or trend, that diversity does generally matter, right? That in general, diverse groups tend to be more accurate across these range of tasks that we have them do than homogeneous groups. And when I say homogeneous, I mean some obvious difference that's been made salient in the group. So everybody from the table is, like, lives in Urbana, right? And we know that, and we might be wearing signs that say, like, Urbana, we're all wearing blue shirts, we're all Democrats, right? There's some, something that makes us all similar that everyone's aware of and is salient. So the diverse groups tend to be more accurate. However, when we ask the groups, did you get this right? Yeah, we see this reversal, right? So diverse groups tend to be less sure that they were effective, right? That they came up with the right answer and tend to be less confident in the decision that they made. So we can easily see how this is, you know, a little bit tricky, right? Because if you have the groups who thought, like, we did awesome, actually not performing as well, and we know that oftentimes we talk about perception being reality, Right? That like if we were gonna promote, like, yeah, we did great and like we're sure this is the right answer. Maybe not, right? This controls for things like individual performance and how well people knew each other. So above and beyond whether you had a genius in your group, right, or whether you were all friends before you sat down together, we see these outcomes. So where do these benefits come from? Right? So I talk about the traditional value in diversity, and I think that this is a, a good and important story, right? That when we have individuals who are engaging with each other who are different from one another, especially someone who is different from everyone else, you may have some different perspectives to bear, right? So if you've had this surgery on your left, right knee, or what, right, whatever happened here, like, so we know some information now about who to come to if we find ourselves in that situation, and you may have some different perspectives to share from the other people at the table in a space, right, that's relevant for that issue. And we can think about this, and I would say that marketing broadly in business space has leveraged that, right, tremendously to enter into new markets where there traditionally 
did not have good representation, right? By you looking at and talking to and working with individuals who were different and understanding better how to market to target approach individuals in a different context. Okay, something that I'm sure people in the room ha already do, right, to some extent, right? Have used these differences that you know between yourselves and others to think about how do I approach somebody who might be different from myself. However, that's not the full story. So the benefit of diversity is not simply that people who are different are bringing this different information. It's that everyone is changing their behavior in the presence of diversity. So I'm gonna talk more deeply about two studies that I'm very fond of, one's someone else's, one's mine, that really highlights this. How does diversity matter? So in this study, these were mock juries, and this used racial diversity. So in one condition, on the left, there are six jurors pulled from the regular jury pool and asked to do a short study where they're gonna look at something kind of like court TV, have a discussion, and make a decision about whether this person is guilty or innocent. So in one condition, the groups were all white. In the other condition, the groups were composed of four white and two black mock jurors. 174 participants, they watched the trial, and they made their decision. Now, I don't know about you, I did that on purpose. That was me, that was me. I don't know about you, but if I am ever in the unfortunate context of having to be someone that is you know, accused of a crime and has a jury that's deciding on me, I would really, really like the people who are making that decision to be paying attention and to get the information right, right? Like just to get the facts straight. It's a lot of information that comes at you, right? If you've served on a jury before, you know that. So when we're in this discussion, you know, am I gonna get facts wrong or am I not gonna get facts wrong? All right, well, when we think about their findings, there's two things that I wanna point out. Think back to the traditional value of diversity and the extra value of diversity. The traditional value of diversity is evidenced, for example, with these two findings. So the first bubble that shows number of factual inaccuracies. So in diverse groups, the black participant in the diverse groups, so the average of the black participants in diverse groups, had fewer factual inaccuracies than the white participants in the all white groups, right? So somehow they were you know, getting things more correct. Now I should mention that this context, there was a black defendant and the person who would accuse that individual was white. So race did play a role, right, in the context that they were looking at this. In addition, the number of race-related issues raised, the black participant in the diverse group raised more race-related issues than the white participants in the all-white groups. Okay, so that's totally is that story of like, okay, well, they're paying more attention, they've had experiences, et cetera, they're bringing that information to bear in the context, great. What they also found, however, which I think is really important and speaks to this additional value, is differences between the white participants in the diverse groups and the white participants in the all white groups. So in the diverse groups, the white participants were raising significantly more novel case facts, right? Information that was, nobody else was talking about this information, but it was relevant to the trial, compared to white participants in the all white groups and had fewer, significantly fewer factual inaccuracies. So this study was really one of the earlier ones that spoke to this idea that, you know, this is impacting everybody in the group. This isn't just about the people who are quote unquote different, bringing some different perspective to bear. So I was very excited about that work and a colleague of mine and I worked on a context to really drill down even more and try to understand, well, what happens in this space where you have this you know, unexpected context of diversity? In other words, where you have a group, so this is a homogeneous group represented by the color of the figures, but you have information differences, right? Or opinion differences, right? Two people think that we should do X, one person says no, I think why, but they're all similar on the surface. And compare that to a context where there's now diversity, so there's someone who's different in some obvious way or salient way, 
But they're not the one that's bringing this perspective, right? It's the other individual that's bringing this perspective, a majority member who is disagreeing with the other people in the group. Does the context of diversity, does the fact that there's someone there different make a difference for that person? So in this space, I'm really interested in comparing these two people, right? These majority group members who disagree with others in the group. In one context, they're in a homogeneous group, and the next, they're in a diverse group. So we did this study, it involved all that videotaping, et cetera, and found that in fact, yes, that individual, so the one that I circled, when they were in a diverse group, they said that they found the group more positive and accepting. They spoke significantly more, and they were much more confident in what they had to say. Now, why does that person matter? Why does any of this matter, right? So this goes back to that point that they had this different perspective. So if they were not willing to share it, then we're not gonna benefit from that in the group, right? We're gonna think we're sitting at a table where everybody agrees, but in fact, we're not. It's just that we don't have the context that it's promoting individuals being willing to share their different perspectives. And one of the things that helps to promote that is the presence of diversity. How does it do this? So this comes from that work and others that looks at these dynamics and looks at the interactions between people and asks questions about what are their concerns and basically shows that this, when there's diversity present, it actually increases their expectation that there will be differences in perspective present. Right? The context of homogeneity decreases our expectation that people are gonna have different perspectives even when the thing that is, makes us homogeneous is not related to the, what we're asking about. So in my study, in the first study that I talked to you about with the mock juries, it was racial diversity. In the study that I showed to you, the difference that made between people was where they lived on campus, right? Some people lived on the north side of campus, some people lived on the south side of campus, but the task that they were doing had nothing to do with which, which side of campus they lived on, right? And I've done other studies that showed whether it's in a context that's relevant for your difference, right? So you're an MBA student and a medical student, and I ask you, you know, well, which market should we target for this medical device, right? That might be relevant to your background. But if I ask you, well, who committed the murder of, you know, Robert Guy, and like you read this information, you actually believe that people who are similar to you, like another med student, is gonna be more likely to agree with your opinion on who committed this murder than an MBA student. So let that sit with you for a moment, right? Like that does not actually make sense on the face, but it doesn't matter because we don't always make sense as human beings. I think we can all attest to that, right? So, so it doesn't necessarily matter that it doesn't make sense. We have these tendencies. So it breaks that up. It reduces some concerns about disagreement. So one of the things that makes it difficult for us to talk about our differences with each other and different perspectives is not wanting to be the disagreer, right? Not wanting to be the person that's like, you know, oh my gosh, I thought, I thought this jury thing was over. Like everybody said they were guilty and then that one person was like, oh, but maybe, right? I was like, now we're gonna spend more time. We're gonna, you know, have to talk more. I can't just go home and pick up my kids from wherever, and, you know. So it's not easy to be the one that's bringing this dissenting perspective to the table. So diversity helps reduce the expectation that there is going to be full agreement. And that allows us to be more likely to bring out that disagreement. And it reduces conformity pressure, right? So that pressure that we should all sort of agree with each other when we're in a particular context or agree about a certain decision. But diversity is not enough. So when I talked, the title of the talk was, right, Beyond Diversity, How Inclusion Makes Us Richer. And one of the things that I would argue is the studies that are showing this difference in increased diversity and these positive outcomes around wealth and you know, income generation and sales returns are looking at contexts where a you know, high percentage of individuals in the organization are you know, racially or ethnic diverse in a couple of those instances, right? And it was gender diverse in another instance. The presence, the mere presence of diversity does not by any means guarantee a space where people are willing to engage and discuss and talk about these differences. 
right? That's where inclusion comes in. What is inclusion? So two quotes that sort of, you know, speak to it indirectly. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Where did the language of inclusion even come from? Right, there's lots of discussion around diversity for you know, many, many, many years. We've had this idea of diversity and it grew out of the realization that just having numbers, right, so having people that represented certain groups was not sufficient to make sure that we were actually engaging, talking with each other, leveraging those different perspectives that we hoped would arise from the fact that we had these different people present. It's beyond diversity, right? It's really about being included. So I'm gonna pause for a moment and ask a question to the group. It goes back to our flower exercise. So when you think about how you came and decided, right? How are you gonna approach the exercise? How did you decide what to talk about when you were trying to think about what made you unique from everybody else in the group? This is not a rhetorical question. So how did you decide? Right? So I should put that out there. So how did you decide, right? Like, I mean, there could be anything, and lots of different things got mentioned. Yes. I think we thought of things about ourselves that we thought others might not share, and then we asked anybody have those in common, and we all had an answer that was surprised when some did. So then we kept looking for things that we did not have. Okay. So is that a pretty common? People say like approach that, right? Many of us used in the room some nodding heads. Yeah. What about here? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, but, so we went the exact opposite. And from that, we realized we'd have one person, one left. Okay. So it's interesting. I mean, you can think about the context of asking those two different questions, right? On one hand, so what makes us all similar at this table? And realizing, like, oh, there's you know, fewer things that make us all similar than I thought. And now that's bringing out, like, oh, here's ways that we're different. Or thinking about, well, you know, what do I think might be different about me, right, than everybody else at this table? And that's definitely a common approach. And I could imagine that the context in which you're seated it might raise one of those approaches versus the other first to your mind, right? If you are looking around the table and you see a lot of similarity, you may think, oh, well, you know, here are things that I could see like make us similar and we're sort of going down the similarity path where the opposite might be true, right? But I think that's less important than this question of if you look around the table and you say, okay, how might people be different than me? What are you using as the basis of that question, right? Like what is it that you're thinking about that's different about yourself, right? Is it experiences you've had in the past. So if I'm at a table with my, you know, mostly management colleagues, you know, most of them don't have engineering backgrounds. Now, not all, I've actually met lots of people who do what I do that have backgrounds in engineering. But it would be a safe one for me to put out there because I've been in these contexts before and had that experience that I was different in this way. All right? but oftentimes, you know, we are effectively feeling out, right? We're looking at others and we're trying to think about, okay, how, you know, who do I think you are, right? And how do I think that you may be different or similar than myself, right? Now, I don't think we do this exercise every day, formally, but we actually do this exercise all the time, informally and sometimes unconsciously when we engage with others, right? How do we see the commonality? So sometimes we have information, sometimes you have information about individuals, right? If you don't have information, what do I assume might be common between us? And do I speak into that space versus what might be different between us? So how did you make that decision? And then another question I have is, what about things that you didn't share? So you don't have to tell me things that you didn't share, but I just want you to pause for a moment and ask yourself, right? Was there something that you thought, yeah, I'm probably different from everybody on this one, but I'm, you know, that navel ring, I'm not sure. 
This is the context. That gambling habit, well, <laughs> you know, I bet I'm different than you, but I'm not really going to say that, right? So I think this is, it's an important issue to raise, and I actually, I think at Theo's table, they were laughing because they were like, well, nobody's, what, no one's a heroin addict here. I was like, and I was thinking, well, that's, I'm amazed that that even came up. Like, <laughs> and then we were like, well, no one says they're a heroin addict at this table. Not casting any aspersions, all right? Right, but you see what I mean? And I think it's important to think about that in the context of differences that are on the surface and differences that are below the surface, right? Because there's some differences that we can all hide and we choose to do so for rational reasons oftentimes, right? But there are some differences that you can't hide, right? They are obvious. They are part of who you are. And we know that individuals, as human beings, we encode these differences or we try to. Right? Our minds want to make the world as simple as possible so that we can go about our lives without being bombarded constantly with our brain right, thinking. So we try to encode, as soon as we meet people, you know, three basic things, gender, race, and age. So there's psychological studies that show that. And those differences, whether the person encoding them is right or not, right? you, you can't hide those differences. So for you to think about the, the value of creating these spaces that are inclusive, right, is not just about realizing this value for these differences that, you know, may or may not be helpful to us if I knew that or didn't know that, but it's also about the fact that there are lots of differences that people are bringing into a space and trying to navigate that can't be hidden. Right? And that we can leverage the value of if we are in an inclusive space. Okay, last couple things. Um, so if all of that sounds like inclusion takes work, it's because it does. <laughs> right? So the work that I'm showing is that people work harder. One of the, the outcomes that I didn't put up when I talked about broadly diverse versus homogeneous groups, right? So diverse groups getting the answer right more of the time, but not necessarily thinking that they did, is that almost without fail, the diverse context when I'm videotaping people, they talk longer, right? They're taking more time. Well, guess what? If you're bringing up more different perspectives that are gonna help us make different decisions, it takes time, right? If you're raising more novel case facts, that takes more time, and then we're going to talk about those things. So people are working harder in those contexts. But if you're like me, we don't like hard work, really. You know, I have a 13-year-old son, and I'm like, I feel you, man. Like, I would love for things to just happen for me without having to work very hard for them to happen. <laughs> you know, like, he just wants every day to be a soccer game, not like to actually practice. I'm like, well. No. But, but in my heart, I do, I understand. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, right? We don't want to work that hard. And even worse, what if we're working hard and we're not feeling that satisfied? We're thinking, oh, we probably got this wrong, you know, because we didn't all agree and we spent all this time and this was like, uh, you know, like going back and forth. So I like to use this analogy, right, about going to the gym. So, if many of you are like me, you're not a huge fan of going to the gym. I mean, you know, I would like to look like that. <laughs> but, do so I want to do the work to actually look like that? Well, you know, <laughs> obviously not. <laughs> but, you know, I do go to the gym, I do exercise, and why do I exercise, right? I don't go to the gym thinking like, oh, that's gonna be so great, I just can't wait to get in there, and like get on that spin cycle, and if you're one of those people like, oh, show me how, right? <laughs> right? But I go because I expect that the work that I put in is going to benefit me, right? I'm gonna work hard, and there's gonna be some outcome. And by the way, the harder that I work, the easier, hopefully, it becomes over time to be in that context, right? To get on the treadmill, to get on the bike, to lift the weights, and to see the benefits that I want. 
So for me, a big part of the story about diversity is to get us out of this mindset of, you know, that it's easy, but rather we're going to work hard and we're going to see a payoff for this effort that we put in to the process. So to unleash this full power, the potential that we have of inclusion, there's a few points, right? One, to really seek out different perspectives. So part of this hard work is making sure that we don't just take the easy answer where we're all at the table and we all say the same answer and we're like, woohoo, we're done, right? Time for beers or whatever it is that you want to do, right, at the end of that discussion. But rather recognize that if we are constantly engaging and we're not seeing some differences, there might be something else that's missing, right? Maybe it's a space where someone's not comfortable saying something that they think is different. And there are tools that we can use, including anonymity, including you know, some group structural tasks where we brainstorm and like put information out there before everybody has decided right, what the answer can be that can help us create a space where people feel more comfortable sharing different perspectives and asking, right, directly, like, okay, someone's not talking or no one has raised the contrarian view, like, let's debate that point, right? What about the other side of this? For me, one of the biggest ones is, right, first to get more comfortable being uncomfortable. I know, it's hard for me too, right? But I've been doing this a long time and I can attest that, you know, it does get a little bit easier to make a mistake, say the wrong thing, apologize for saying that wrong thing, you know, ask the person if they, you can learn from them about whatever it was you said or did that, you know, bothered them or disturbed them or what have you. So we have to get a little bit more comfortable being uncomfortable to leverage this and to not assume we know who's adding value to the context, right? So seeking out that information about what are the differences present in the group, right, between us, not just sticking with the surface or even the, you know, the few things that you know that may not even be surface, right, but those few things that you already know and realizing there's a lot more there underneath that you can learn about and leverage from and use that to identify people's expertise right, their actual expertise and actual information that they have that can help you accomplish your goals better, right? Don't let someone's difference allow you to miss out on some valuable knowledge that they might hold. All right. So I'm going to, there's lots of times for questions because I actually, this is, I mean, so what I would like to do is to open up into a discussion um, because what I th said to Theo is what I care the most about with my work is really helping to bring this from this, you know, umbrella and this context that's outside of what you do to your actual context, right? How do these points that I've raised and broader questions about diversity and inclusion resonate in your context. So I'm going to open up now to questions and answers in that space. Yes. I'm curious about um, the study you showed the X and the Y of the two people who didn't agree. What that looks like if the person who doesn't agree isn't of the dominant group. You know what I'm saying? So is it does it matter if that person, you know, if it's homogeneous, that says one thing. If there are more diverse voices in the room, does it matter? I imagine it does. Um, who's the one sort of dissenting? Yes. So that speaks to this, when I talk about the traditional value of diversity, and this idea that we expect that people who are different from us in some salient way, right? Like if I said, okay, we're all advancement people, and then there's somebody from, I don't know, the marketing department, right? You'd be like, okay, well, they're probably gonna think something different than we do. And to your point, if that difference is something that we recognize and believe has value for the conversation that we're having, then that's great, 
right? So it allows the person who has this difference to express that difference. And importantly, when I talk about inclusion, it allows us to include that perspective in the conversation. So the mock jury one that I talked about, and, I, and I've studied this um, issue in a different context, one of the reasons why I think that racial diversity helped performance in that context was because the context had some racial dimension to it, right? And so the black jurors that were, mock jurors that were there were seen as experts in a way. So if I see your difference as expertise that I value, then it's more easily incorporated, right? You are included. Unfortunately, if that difference is not valued, right? So there's some work that has looked at um, in small groups of males and females and put women in the context where they had expertise in the group or men in the context where they had expertise in the group, but it was a context where it wasn't expected that women would have a lot of knowledge, the teams didn't benefit from that expertise, right? That environment, I would argue, was not the kind of inclusive environment that we are trying to promote that would allow the group, the organization, to benefit from this inherent expertise. Rather, you were different from everybody, but we didn't necessarily value that difference, and so it wasn't helpful. And so that's a big but around what I said earlier, right? Diversity can be beneficial under the right circumstances. And that's for me why I think inclusion as a concept is so important. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So in the next step of that, right, if you think strategically, right, how do you identify strategies for being, um, for identifying those expertise, right? So, you know, just thinking of my, my own staff, um, one of the things I've tried to make sure that, that we do is we, we include civil service staff in all of our, our meetings and our discussions about strategy and where we're going and that kind of thing. But I've been in units where, you know, civil service is never included in that, right? Um, and it, as over time, we've been able, I've seen in those folks, you know, real um, talents um, that make the work better, right? Um, but if you're coming in, say, to a new situation, you don't know people personally. I mean, I've been there four years, so you know it took me four years to feel really comfortable with that. How how would you go about identifying, you know, those expertises that you do value? So it's a great question. I love this that example on two levels, right? Of, in, for example, including the civil service into the conversation. So I certainly have been in context where I've seen that done well. I've been in context where I've seen that done not so well, right? Um, in a different dy dynamic or domain, even just something as simple as, you know, our gatherings, so not even about the work, right, but just gatherings where we regularly are comfortable letting everybody just sort of filter off into their groups. So all the civil service people over here, and you know, I'm faculty, the faculty over here, and the doctoral students are back there, and like, this is just fine. So you can imagine as a diversity scholar, I'm like, you know, we, like, you know, yeah, I mean, there are times where we just want to talk with people who are dealing with a similar issue than us, and we want to get some specific information, but there's lots of loss that happens, I think, when that's not leveraged and promoted. So one simple way, I mean, I thought I'm suggesting you use the flower exercise for, you know, but you know, something like that I think is, is fine, right? Especially at an early stage when new people are coming into the group, because I think that there's also this, this um, context where people who've been there a while feel like, well, I already know this and I already know, right? And so like, why are you doing this thing? So we can help like blame slash leverage our newcomers and say, hey, you know, we've got new people here, and like, let's open up and, you know, do some exercise that helps us understand, like, well, where do we care about expertise, and what experiences have you had that fall into that category? Because it's not always on a resume, right? Especially to your point, if it's a job that is outside of, you know, you're doing a civil service job that seems like different than, right, the work advancement. Does that help? to me. 
Uh, I was curious about your research when you talk about group dynamics, when you have, um, I mean, I think all of us can agree that if you have a group where only one different perspective is represented, that's better than none. But for example, when you have, say, one Latino or Lat one African American or one Asian American, oftentimes they can be looked at to represent the entire group. So you have this monolithic kind of, what do, what do African Americans think on, about this? What do, or in my case, what do half Indians raised in Canada think about this? I mean, it's not a, it's not a universal experience, right? So I was wondering if your research delved into that kind of, I guess, monolithic expectation from, from people when they're in a group like that, because this happens all the time, oftentimes in academic environments, underrepresented um, students. There's only one in a, in a session or in a TA group or whatever. So I would say my research, I don't ask that specific question in my research, um, but I am definitely aware of that phenomena and tendency in that I think for me, one of the things that can help us break out of that is having this understanding of the multiple ways in which we have similarities and differences, right? So it's, it's too often the case where, you know, when I'm giving this kind of a presentation, I, you know, and I'm talking to managers in an organization and say, okay, you're putting teams together, right? And you might know the value that your different team members have, right? The experiences that they've had. You put a team together for a reason. It so happens that there may be one African-American person on that team. You probably didn't put them on that team because they were African-American, right? They have some other knowledge, you know, experience, value. Now, it may also be beneficial to the team that they're African-American, but that's not the sole reason. But are you actually communicating that to the rest of the team members? Right? Are you just assuming that everyone that's getting together knows? Oh, we know, right? Like, why we're here? Like, we all know what the, right, what the value is that everybody brings? Not necessarily, right? So if we can start emphasizing that and having, you know, social category diversity that may be salient on the surface, but not isolating that person and putting them in the box, and I would definitely highly recommend not asking that question of like, well, what do, you know, what do the black people think? What do the, <laughs> what do the women think about this? And you're like, hey, I'm just one of them, you know? <laughs> um, and instead, you know, opening that up more to the group. So I know that's not rocket science. And I know you're like, it happens. I'm like, and I know it does, <laughs> right? It does happen. But I think this can help us, you know, maybe rethink, okay, this is one particular experience, and you may have some information that I don't have that's related to that experience, but there's more to it than just that. Others. Hi, so I'm interested if you could talk a little bit more about uh, creating an environment that is inclusive, similar to kind of the question that was asked earlier around strategies. And I'm also thinking about this in the context of advancement where we get, you know, there may be team members who come in rather quickly or there, there's transition that happens kind of frequently. Um, and so just kind of wondering, you know, the traditional kind of line of thinking in teams is that storming, norming, performing structure. And I don't know that there is, it's difficult when there's a lot of uh, fluidity in the process to create a, an inclusive environment at the same time. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit to that. Sure. <laughs> um, I think for sure in environments where there's more turnover, it's, there's more challenge. Um, but I would really emphasize that leadership matters, right? Like the tone at the top idea, like that, it's, it's meaningful, right? Um, you're setting the tone, you're helping to um, create norms of behavior interaction. When I talk about something like promoting dissent, right, that means, you know, when someone says something that's different with what others said, right, you're not cringing or eye rolling or like, oh, now we have to sit, and, you know, here comes the different, whatever, right, I mean, or you're actually asking for, right, facilitating like, we need to hear different perspectives on this, right? And if, if we're not having different perspectives at this table, maybe we don't have all the right people at this table, right? How do we get other people in? How do we congratulate people, reward people when they say something that is different, that made us work a little bit more and come up with a better idea? 
right? How do we share with people back in the organization, you know, hey, this happened and this is what came out of it, right? So I think it's, it's tough because in organizations, we're all taxed with a lot of work and not enough time. And we're it's sort of go, 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 and what's the next goal and the next thing, right? And there's not a lot of backward looking to say, you know, here's what happened and here's how it benefited us, right? So that the next time we're in this situation, there's more buy-in from the group around taking that extra time, asking these additional questions, bringing in other people in the team, right? Leveraging in that way, right? There's, there's far too many contexts where the leader says, you know, so here's what I think. What does everybody else think? <laughs> we think what you think. <laughs> Do you sign our checks? <laughs> you are awesome, right? <laughs> like, and that, you know, it, it just, it happens far too frequently. So it's not on one hand to say that it's super easy to create inclusive environments because there are challenges to doing so, but it's also not so hard to make starts and movements in the right direction. And if the turnover isn't at the top, then the leadership setting the tone is gonna really help maintain and promote that type of environment. Does that help? There was a hand up front I saw before. So I have actually personally not looked at age diversity in my work. Um, I've looked at some of the differences I mentioned before, gender, race, political affiliation. Um, what I know about generational diversity is that, you know, there are, again, we have to be very careful, right? You know, I didn't want to do the three hour version of this conversation, right? Where I talk a lot about unconscious bias and stereotypes and having to be very careful to the point earlier about putting people in a box, right? Sometimes it's even, you know, we mean it in a very positive way, right? There are positive stereotypes that apply to certain groups that might not apply at all to the individual that you're engaging with that could still be offensive, even though you're saying something, you know, great, like, you're great at math, right? Or like, you know, you're the, you should fix this technology problem we're having because you're, you know, insert whatever category here that's coming into your mind, right? So, um, so I think that while there are some broad differences between generations, right, approaches, I mean, obviously experiences, we have to be careful about, again, putting people into boxes just because they are a certain age. Um, you know, or come from a certain generation, but it is a difference that needs to be managed, and it's definitely a difference that can be leveraged, right? I think um, there's work at, one example I can think of is, I think it was the BMW plant that made some shifts and changes in the way that they um, set up work for older employees and got huge productivity gains, right, out of making some changes that made the workplace more adaptive for that population. Whereas if they hadn't been open to thinking about the value of all the different employees that work there at every age, they may not have done that. So I know that's not a deep answer to your question, but I think really thinking about how do we leverage, again, what is your expertise in this particular domain, you know, how do we leverage that to benefit the organization? I mean, are there specific examples or like, I'm, I'm open to that too. People are like, we're not gonna say anything specific. <laughs> but if there's a specific example you could think of, I'd love to talk about that too. No, I'm not saying this point. I'm just, um, I'm, I'm noticing that I've been in the room a long time now. And it's just so, there's an awareness of I'm stepping into the people more of a senior gender role. Yeah. And I'm a senior gender role. And I'm adjusting to that. Or, I don't know, I was like, I, I, I was like, right, we were like, what, what's that? <laughs> right, it's like, I know, should, should we enlighten, maybe, could you, could you say that again so we can enlighten the other half of the room since, 
since we didn't hear that. So what, what was that? She said she was stepping in the senior generation and I'm 57 years old, so I said, horrors. Horrors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for that clarification. Because <laughs> we were all kind of like, ah, what was that? Yeah, no, not that. All right. Other questions? Up in the front. Yes. I, I don't know if I want to ask my question after this now. So one could argue that the least amount of diverse opinions in the United States today is in politics. Look no further than left, right, right? How do you take some of your research, or do you take some of your research to educate the American population and people that there is greatness in diversity, right? And so, like the slide that you showed with having your opinion and thinking it's the greatest opinion ever, I mean, that seems to flow really well in that space. I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, thank you. I feel like there was a compliment in there, so I'm like, yay, thank you. Um, and I'm trying. Um, I will say, you know, there is sort of the academic, like, at your computer, just like typing out papers that sadly don't necessarily go to a broad audience. Um, but some, some efforts to share findings more broadly, right, in the hopes that people will value them and use them to benefit. So I have been able to do some sharing. Um, I'm happy to share more, so feel free to you know, spread the word, if you will. Um, but I want to come back to the, the first part about the political context that you mentioned. I think that's a really interesting one and important one because there's a paper that I've I'm working on right now that we actually use that context as sort of the start to the paper in talking about the challenge of sharing different perspectives when you are in a majority, right? Or you not even in a majority per se, but when your perspective differs from somebody who is in your in-group. So what I think we're seeing is not actually a lack of difference of opinions, it's a lack of difference of expressed perspectives and a lot of pressure to conform within these groups because the stakes are very high. Um, and we can see that if you decide to step out from the dominant view of your group, the threats are real, right? I mean, it's not, it's not an idle context. So I think from my perspective as a diversity scholar, we are suffering as a whole in mass because dialogue is not happening, right? We are not actually fully engaging and allowing people to share these different perspectives because there's so much threat and risk and fear. And I think I would build on that to say in this space, in the space of the work that you do, um, that's also a challenge, right? I mean, for all of us, it's a challenge because we're in a space right now where I feel that, you know, questions, assumptions, like there's just huge negatives to saying anything that is construed by someone else in some negative way. And granted, I think we can also say that, there, you know, there's lots of negativity out there too, right? So it's not like, you know, everyone's has good meaning and good intent, right? There are some people out there that have some clear ill intent, but most people, I would say, don't have that ill intent, but many people are very afraid to say something, right? To ask questions, to engage, because they don't want to be put in a box of, you know, othering you, right? Or being, you know, racist, sexist, et cetera. Um, for me, that's completely the opposite, right, of what I'm, trying to say in that how do we benefit from these different perspectives if we're not allowed to talk with each other, right? Or actually share different perspectives and make mistakes, right? And be a little bit uncomfortable and not, you know, slam somebody the first time that they say something that, you know, may be, um, you know, uncomfortable or awkward or even wrong, right? Just incorrect. So I'm personally experiencing it as a very challenging time because I think the stuff that I want to promote the most and I think will push us the furthest is really feeling some pushback right now, um, you know, from both sides. So I, mean, I don't know if that was helpful. All I can say is that I, 
I highly encourage everyone in the room to get more comfortable being uncomfortable, to be willing to engage with others and risk having some conversations that are uncomfortable and to think about asking, asking questions, right? Like, so how do we find out where the expertise lies? How do we find out, right? Who knows what? You know, we can ask, right? Go less on our assumptions and ask more questions. Um, I, I just wanna say thank you for uh, coming here and sharing this information. I think this is very, very important, especially for us because uh, a lot of us in this room are major gift officers, and we encode information. We look at where people live, we look at their giving history, we look at their age, and so a lot of what we're doing is interpreting, and we're interpreting things imperfectly. And I think you can tell that sometimes when you're attending events, and those events are overwhelmingly uh, white and Caucasian. And I just, I think it's so important uh, for us all to absorb this message and to um, be self-aware in this space. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate that and I, I really, again, encourage you all because I think that the work that you're doing is really vitally important for the university, Ob not in just the obvious way, right? Like obviously, um, you know, our salaries, the students' ability to get scholarships. I mean, every, you know, like this is the support of the university in so many ways. But I also want to emphasize that the work that you do in reaching out to people is not just about leveraging their experiences when they were here and building off of that and their interest in, you know, it's also continuing that, right, experience, like helping those individuals engage now with the university and that, you know, for myself, like I was a civil engineer, right, now I'm a social scientist. Okay, I'm still an engineer. But, <laughs> But I'm also a social scientist, right? And so if my institutions that I attended want to engage with me and only think about me through the lens of my major, they're gonna miss a lot, right? For me, when I was in grad school, I really came very much into my identity, my racial identity, right? Like it really became very important to me and I engaged with people around that. And that's something that I don't want my university to ignore about me, right? I want them to think about how do they value that and how do we leverage that and engage with me around that, right? So I'm not at all here to say that it's easy, but I'm definitely here to say that doing this really has the potential to enrich us, not just monetarily, right, but really as a society. And I think, should I stop or? Oh, we do one more. One more question? Okay, yes. Yep. Of, uh, you mentioned we should get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Along the lines of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, I think I can speak on behalf of most people in the room. We are the people that run into the discomfort uh, quite regularly. Um, and, um, and I wonder if you have some practical tips along the lines. I know uh, we can believe that it's the right thing to do, but how do we get ready for that and, and how, do we, um, how do we do that well? Can so I'd love, can you get a little bit more concrete? Like, is there any circumstance you can think sometimes, of? Sometimes our donors are the most um, strongly opinionated about something about the campus, and, and some of our colleagues or faculty members might decide to just disengage, but we know there's a good reason to continue the engagement, and perhaps their frustration is out of passion and, and support for what they really love, and so we go on in and we have the conversations and, and we shield others from kind of having those sometimes. And I was just wondering about how do you get ready for the, the tough meeting, you know, the, the tough committee meetings where you know there will be disagreements. <laughs> I mean, I know we can take a sip of water and wait and think. There's one, right? But, but are there some other things that you've, you've shared or thought about? <laughs> um, I definitely don't have an easy answer to that. Um, I will say that it's an issue that crosses so many different domains. Um, and it brings to mind, for me, my um, role as an ethics teacher. So I've taught ethics for a number of years. And you know, I'm always trying to promote for our young people, right, our students. 
um, the importance of having a compass, setting boundaries, right, standing your ground. Um, and it is amazing to me how often the concern that comes out is like, but if I say something, I will be fired. They will fire me. <laughs> I'll have no job, I'll have no, right? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, how did we get to, you know, this ultimate, like, terrible outcome? I'm like, in fact, I show them, you know, a number of cases where I'm like, actually, what happens most of the time is, you know, one, you shouldn't make the assumption that the person asking you this question did so knowingly to do something false, right? Secondly, even if they did, and you decided that you didn't want to do that thing, there are many circumstances where they just go ask somebody else, right? Like, if they were asking you to sign this document, it's like, you're not the only person that can sign it. Well, let me go find somebody else who's willing to sign it. And you do not lose your job. So I think for me, part of this question about being, you know, comfortable being uncomfortable is, one, we need to get out of the mindset of imagining the worst case scenario for engaging, right? A lot of times this conversation around diversity has been like, oh, isn't it great that diversity can bring us these different perspectives, but isn't it terrible that, you know, we don't enjoy being in these groups as much? I'm like, you know, no one said that we were running from, screaming from the room, right? Like, I never want to work with these people again. Like, this was the worst experience. Like, right, that, that's not the, the standard. So when I say getting comfortable feeling more uncomfortable, it's not like, you know, it's not gonna be water torture, right? Like, it is gonna be an awkward conversation, right? A difficult conversation. But if you never engage in that difficult conversation, like, how will you move the needle? Um, so that's one. And two is, you know, I hate to say it, but it's just like, we'll have to deal with those consequences, right? Like, I, it's, there, there can be consequences. Um, you know, I can't say that there won't be any consequences. But again, if we never do anything different, then we're not gonna ever have any different outcomes. So, Thank you. yeah, you're welcome. Theo? Well, no, I, Tony, you said everything perfectly well too to cap everything off and I really appreciate taking the time to speak with all of us on this topic. Um, coming away from campus out here to do this and all the preparation too as well. So please join me with a big round of applause for Professor Denise and Laura. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. And um, you know, I am on campus, so if you have questions or you want to reach out, absolutely feel free to reach out to me. Yes, thank you. Thank you.